Yeah, isn't that exciting to see all that stuff? It's exciting to uh, see Eric. He just appeared like he was on the roof. He was on the stage. I mean, it was just like crazy. And uh, the guy that does all of that work for us right here, Ryan, can you love on Ryan for all his work? He's a great job. So uh, I just remember when we uh, started that mission uh, fund many years ago, I remember the very first time we ever did it, we had $1,000 that we were going to give to mission work. That's, I mean, those are the days I remember. I can remember when our goal was five grand. That was a goal we had. So to see this growing every year by your generosity is just a powerful thing. I'm excited about it. So this is a big thing we do. And, and if you're a guest, I want you to understand this. All of that money that we raise, 100% of it, every penny is expended in missions outside of our church the next year. It's all given away. And that's our goal in that. So just want to commend that to you. So, hey, here we are. We're in, a, we're in our, uh, our march toward Christmas Eve. And we're lighting a candle uh, every week sort of as a countdown. We're calling it our countdown to Christmas. We lit a candle last week to commemorate the value of expectation. You just beautifully sang that. And we were talking about come thou long expected Jesus. There was a time in religious history when... Um, they were looking for a word, but they couldn't hear a word. And the Bible says that the word was made flesh and made present to us. And so every year we kind of light a candle to just commemorate that important understanding. Uh, this morning, or now this afternoon, we're going to light a second candle to commemorate the idea that God has come to us in the presence of Christ, in the name of Christ, uh, and he's come in love. Uh, one of the most important passages of Scripture is one that many of us, even slightly irreligious people, are familiar with. It's a passage of Scripture. We know it as John chapter 3, verse 16. Many of us have it sort of memorized in our head. It goes like this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but we'll have everlasting life. And so we remember at this time of year that uh, God has come to us and he's come to us in love. And I just want to say this represents really good news. And I believe that if we understand that really fully, it's thrilling news. And so we are in a series right now in our church. We're just calling the series A Thrill of Hope. Say it with me. A thrill of hope. Now say it like you have hope, okay? A thrill of hope. Okay, that's a lot better. And um, we uh, came up with this series a few years ago. I just tapped onto this line that's in this hymn, uh, this carol that we're going to sing actually at the end of our time together. It's a beautiful, the, they do a beautiful version of it. And the line in the, in the song just says this, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. And I just thought, man, that's if we understand that right, this is what Christmas should do. It should offer hope to us. And if we understand really what the biblical writers are seeking to convey in all of the scriptures to us, it should offer to us not just hope, but thrilling hope. And so that's what we're learning uh, right now in this series. Now, if you were with us last week, we began, and this is basically the idea that we were trying to communicate last week. We have to be careful in December because this time of the year can deceive us. And it can deceive us because with all of the responsibilities and all of the, the, the festivities and all of the things that we typically do in December, we can be lulled into the idea, the mistaken notion, if you will, that hope comes from within. And that if we pretty ourselves up, if we do everything right, if we make it light and we light candles and we do all this stuff, then, then that's enough and it's going to come from within. And I want to tell you what, at the end of the day, that's not encouraging. I think it's discouraging. And so I have, I have said this, it sounds a little counterintuitive, I literally believe this. I think Christmas begins not by pretending you can, but by admitting you can't. That's where I think really Christmas begins. Because if we really understand this long expected Jesus, if we really understand that God has come to us in flesh and he's come to offer love, unconditional love to us, that's a hope from the outside. 
not from the inside. And so uh, this afternoon, what I want to do, I want to go back to this story that we're looking at. I want to widen the angle, widen the lens, if you will, on the story, and I want to pick some more ripe fruit right off the tree that's in front of us, around us. And we're going to read uh, this afternoon now from Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, one of my favorite Christmas stories. It's really, we, we think of it this way, the story of the shepherds, all right? And picking up at Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Here's what it says. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And that's what we looked at last week. Good news that will cause great joy for all the people. For today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. And he is the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's go and let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had both seen and heard, and which were just as they had been told. And this other word that comes to us from the pen of the Apostle Paul, Romans 10, verse 15, where he just simply says this, uh, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Okay? Let's pray. Uh, God, in this moment, we want to come by the power of your Spirit, and we, we want to we do interior work. Now, when we leave here, we're, we're going to get accustomed again to the responsibilities and the demands and all the expectations that really flow into this season. Many of them are exciting. But in this moment, oh God, we're going to come to you now and we're going to invite you to do some work within us. I, I pray in Jesus' name right now for people who are here who are um, part of that weary world. And I pray that you bring a fresh word to bring energy and hope to them. I pray for those who's, who are here who might have hard hearts that you might say something that would crack that open and that they would see maybe for the very first time, Jesus, about this great love we're proclaiming and talking about. You come with your power and you speak to every human heart in this place and those listening online. And everyone said, amen. When I was in seminary, I had to take a class that, um, and the title of the class is a uh, word that we only hear of in church. And I would say in, in later years, really, this word has fallen on hard times. And I want to explain it to you. I had to take a class in evangelism. And uh, that was a class uh, that I, I remember. And um, evangelism is where we actually get the word evangelist. And typically today, um, when we think of an evangelist, uh, many of us, and I have friends for whom this is especially true, they don't think about it in a kind way. And in fact, oftentimes the image that is drawn is an image maybe of somebody proclaiming a message to us and maybe even, you know, being hard and saying the hard things of scripture and, and it doesn't really pull us to God. Sometimes it can repel us back from God. And that's our understanding of the word evangelist, which is really sad to me because if we understood what this word means, it would, I think, change a lot of things about even how we view our faith. 
And I have to tell you, I'm going to just name it. A lot of times communicators, we don't sort of tell you the thing up front. We let, let it be revealed to you, but I'm just going to name it up front. One of my goals in this talk is to change forever how you think of the word evangelism or evangelist. The word in the Greek uh, is the word euangelion, which uh, stands for one who proclaims. And euangelis uh, is the name, uh, really, uh, of the person that would serve as an evangelist. And here's actually how the word gets its deeper meaning. If you go back to ancient biblical times, during times of war, there was a particular position com uh, commissioned by the king in a military unit to be the Yuan Galiz, the person who would tell. And the Yuan Galiz typically sat next to or was positioned always by the lieutenant in a king's army, and they would be the one that would be ready uh, when the lieutenant was for sure sure certain that the battle was the king's, he would commission the Yuan Galiz to run and tell the king that he had won the battle. Now, if you think about that, that's kind of an interesting image. And today, we live in a world where information comes to us in a millisecond, right? And, I, and anybody else agree? I don't know that that's always a good thing. We know every bad thing that's happening in the world at, at the same time. And I think it adds sometimes to the feeling. How many of you would agree with me that, that a lot of times in 2017, it just felt like we were getting bad news after bad news after bad news. Anybody, right? And so I don't know that that's good, but if you think back about it, in fact, I was thinking of this because just this past Friday, right, was December 7th, which is a day that we remember in our history. I can say it this way, December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy, right? The battle at Pearl Harbor. And it's interesting to study that battle and to remember this skirmish that happened in Pearl Harbor. The news of that event was slow in getting back to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And so you don't have to go really far back in history to notice that there was some extra work required to get the news out, if you will. And you go all the way back into ancient times, they would commission a person specifically required to be the Yuan Galiz who was ready to be commissioned from the lieutenant once the word was certain from the lieutenant that the battle had been won, the Yuan Galiz would run to the king and tell him that the battle was won. Now it's interesting, you can go back and study this. There was a guy in history, uh, we know him, here's an image of him, I don't know if this is what it looked like, but this is the history, the story of him. It was a guy by the name of Pheidippides, an actual person in history, uh, in 490 uh, BC, who was the guy who was the Euangelis who ran from Athens, listen to this, with the news of a great victory his people had over the Persians in a place called Marathon. Not the Keys, by the way. Okay? And he ran, you get it? They thought he ran 26 miles to Marathon. You, you tracking with me? Okay? Only here's an interesting uh, historical side note. When he told the king that the battle was the king's, he fell over dead from exhaustion, right? Which is today why I don't run marathons right there, okay? And it's interesting uh, to consider this, that um, when he ran to the king to tell the king that the battle was the king's, he would, they would often use a phrase, and this is the phrase they would use. The phrase was nen akikamen. Nen akikamen, which translates this. Rejoice, the king has conquered. Okay, right? Now we are gonna listen to that going, cool, who cares? It actually has a unique place in history because if you shorten the phrase, this is the phrase shortened. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Yeah. In fact, um, many of y'all know I don't really run uh, marathons. I run the race for the pies every year. I'm a loser, right? 
okay? But um, I, I will tell you, it's interesting. A few years ago, I, I enjoy learning about this. I read a book, a fascinating book, by a guy by the name of uh, Dean Carnazes, and he wrote a book entitled The Ultra Marathon Man. And this guy is quite an amazing athlete. In fact, not too long ago, he ran 50 marathons in 50 states in 50 days. He ran a marathon every day for 50 days. Okay, right? And uh, he learned about the story of Pheidippides, and he went where we think Pheidippides ran the race. And interestingly, what Dean Carnazes discovered is that actually Pheidippides, if he ran what was marked out in history, he didn't actually run 26 miles one direction. He ran 149 miles to tell the king. Now we know why he died. Okay? So I just wanted to clear up this history. Let's close in prayer. Okay? No. (laughs) Sermon not over. But here's the interesting thing. One of the things that I think makes this time of the year powerful it's, it's the first part of what I was talking about earlier. It's that you and I are recipients of good news. Yeah. Yeah. We're recipients of news that, that, I mean, I think when we understand this correctly, I mean, can it actually be that there is a God in heaven who's revealed himself in human flesh and loves us unconditionally and meets us where we are? That we don't have to clean ourselves up to this God, but God begins right where we are? Or I have a friend who says it this way, do you mean I don't have to put lipstick on the pig anymore? We don't. That was supposed to be funny, by the way. Okay, here's the interesting thing. That's thrilling news. And I don't know what you've heard about this God, this Christian God that we worship, but I can tell you this. The Bible says he meets us where we are. He loves us unconditionally. He doesn't come with judgment. He comes with grace. His gospel is, is peace. We just sang it. Now, can I tell you something that's equally as thrilling? Here's what's equally as thrilling. That God has commissioned you and I, watch this, to be the euangelies, to be commissioned to take that good news and dispatch it to someone else. It's a part of the Christian experience. I I want us to redeem and restore If you're here this afternoon and you self-identify as a follower of Christ, he said, you go be my news bearer. You carry good news to those who need to hear. And it's interesting to me, uh, one of the things that I love about the Christmas story, in fact, that I love about all of the gospels taken together, is the amazing people that God used and commissioned to share his good news, to tell his story. It's one of the things, in fact, apologists believe adds veracity to the truth of the scriptures. Watch this. They weren't, the writers of scripture weren't trying to pretty up the story to make it as best presentable as they can. They were just telling the facts as they saw them. You go all the way back to the very first people who saw the tomb empty, who were they? They were women. Women in that culture, property to be disposed of at any time at will. If they were really going to pretty up the story, they wouldn't have commissioned. God wouldn't have used a woman to be the one to tell the story, to be the first one to go to the tomb and find out. Adds veracity. Adds, adds something to the story. And then you click over to the, to the incarnation, the coming of Christ, Who does God use? He uses the shepherds. That's why I love the story. Common people, people of low order, people who rarely owned anything, most who were shepherds were not ever tending their own flocks. They were tending the possessions of someone else. In fact, a little anecdote in the story, it's interesting. It says, of these shepherds who are tending the flocks, and it says, nearby, you know what scholars think is happening there? That these were probably the sheep that were used for the temple sacrifices since they were near Jerusalem. And God goes to those shepherds through the angel and says, you be the euangelies 
to take my message to a world that needs to hear. Luke chapter 2, verse 10 gives us an idea of it, and you can see it in the text. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. It'll cause great joy for all the people. Notice what it says. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. And so they're the recipients of it. And then look what happens in verse 17. In verse 17, it says this. And when they had seen him, they spread the word. They spread the word. Anybody who's here this afternoon, this is what I believe uh, all the way to the core of my being. I believe you are here today, whether you self-identify as a follower of Christ or not, and if you're just on the journey, that's great, but here's what I would tell you. You're here even investigating this because somebody was dispatched and told you the good news, and you've come to see for yourself. That's what this is all about. I love how verse 18 says what happened as a result of it. And all who heard it were amazed. I mean, isn't that what good news does? It's amazing. I mean, you ever, you ever get a word? Uh, Paul had a phrase he used to use. He said, to get a word in due season. Like to get a word when you need a word. You ever need a word? And the word comes, and it's just the right word. At the right time, I was thinking about how to communicate like this, and I thought of something. I don't know if you'll get it. It makes sense. It'll show you how my brain is operating right now. I remember, I remember receiving the word uh, for the first time I was in sixth grade that a girl liked me. And, and this is usually how you receive the word. It was something like this. You would, right? Isn't that how it all come down? In fact, that's how I caught my wife right there. That's how I did it. I'm lying. That's not how I did it. No, okay. But I, I remember being, I went to an all sixth grade uh, junior high. Everybody was in sixth grade. And I remember going into a big class uh, one day and this girl came over and she handed me a note on behalf of somebody else, right? You know how it goes down, right? And, uh, and, and I remember opening this note, and I'm, because I was not a player in sixth grade. I know that's hard to figure out. And um, so I got this, I got the note, and, and to be honest with you, I didn't even believe it. And I'm like, I'm not, I, don't, I don't believe that. I'm getting punked. I'm sure it was like my friend Donald had done it, you know, kind of a thing. So I go into class the next day, and I, I'm in this big auditorium, I'm in this science class, and I look over, and there's the girl that I have a crush on, and this is what she's doing. She's looking at me and she's going, you, I like you. And I want to tell you, this is exactly what I did. I'm going to play it out for you in real time. Isn't that smooth? I didn't think she was talking to me. And so that was the, that was the, the you know, that was my first uh, crush. And that was, you know, a romance to last for all time. It lasted about 30 days, and I'll never forget, I went to her birthday party, and this guy with feathered hair and puka shells shows up, and she dropped me like a hot rock. <laughs> I kid you not, and to this day, puka shell, I hate puka shells. <laughs> you know, I just hate it. I, I remember, I, I've shared this before, I just went home and listened to really bad music back then. You remember the song like, all by myself, <laughs> right? I can't live. Oh, Mandy. How many of y'all remember that one? I had a guy that came out and said, man, I had my first crush to old man. I said, don't tell anybody, <laughs> you know. But here's the thing. God has commissioned us to be the news, news bearers, bearers. He's commissioned us to be the Yuan Galis who are dispatched by the king to tell the best news ever. In fact, I, I thought about, what is, so what does that look like in today's culture? I mean, here we are, right? I, 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 many of you know this. We, we say it a lot. Here we are, Palm Beach County, number one unchurched county in America. Right? How do we do it? Well, I've, I've discovered, and I think there are, there's a rhythm to this. It's a rhythm. And I think there are four things I want to share with you real quickly. We'll be done. The first one is this. If we're going to be good news tellers, we got to live the story. 
we have to live the story. One, one of my first uh, verses of scripture I ever memorized, so it's in my brain in the New American Standard Version, is Colossians 2, 6, and 7. And in the NIV, Paul says it this way. So then just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, look at this, continue to live your lives in him. Figure out a way, he's saying, to continue to live in a way that makes your faith vital and living to you. Figure that out. And, and, and really what he's saying, he's presupposing we can do that. We can figure it out. We can figure out a way to live our lives. And look at, he goes on, rooted in him, built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. I think about this verse all the time. What does it mean? So then as you've received, I mean, you've received this God of love. He's come to you. He's manifest his love to you. Hey, figure out a way to live. Here's what I want to tell everybody in the room. I want to tell everybody in the room and those streaming the service online, right? If you self-identify as a Christ follower in this culture, people are watching you. And let me just go ahead and say it in a slightly more offensive way. Every now and again, I run into people who are boastful in the way they, they identify as a Christ follower, but there's such disharmony in the way they live. I don't know about you. I want to take $5 out and say, here's five bucks. Don't tell anybody you love Jesus. Okay? Probably get notes about that. It's just true. We got to live our faith. We got to live our faith in a way that, 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 that answers, you know, we have to answer the question. We, we have to I think of it this way, um, you, know, I, you know, live in such a way as that it makes Christ relevant. And then I, I, I think this, this is a really important one. I think we have to learn how to show up. Once we, once we got the living piece down, I think it's important just to show up. And, and really what I'm trying to communicate here is that we're present one writer I read from recently says this, we should always remember that every space, every place is brimming with redemptive potential. What if, what, what if we were to live like that is true? What if we were to, like some of us just, I would say this, start at your house, start in your home, and just accept the idea that there's something, redempt, there's redemptive potential that's happening right here in this spot right? I, I, I just remember this. I, I, I think this is what the scriptures teach. It's fun. It's fun to think right now we're branding another campus. This is a campus that I grew up in. It had a lot of meaning to me. I had a, I had a pastor, a uh, youth pastor used to say this, you know, that we should, we should live our Christian lives as though if we were arrested for being Christian, there'd be enough evidence to convict us of the crime. I mean, come on, isn't that awesome? This week, uh, the, our, some of our construction team called me and they said, hey, Pastor Dale, I know that you, you, you placed a Bible under the stage from where you, would, you guys would do some preaching and proclaiming and singing and all that. Do you want to do that on the East Campus too? I said, oh, fantastic idea. And so I, I thought about this really a long, way, a long time and I, and I picked a Bible to take over there. In fact, I got a picture of it I want to show you. There it is. That's the Bible that I bought when I was a first a Christ follower in that church. Isn't that cool? And so I, I, I took that, old, that good friend right there and I took it over and I gave it to Jason and Jason and I placed it right there where when whoever's preaching is gonna stand there to preach and then we covered it up and we said a prayer over that. You know, we have to be able to relate. We gotta be present. I mean, what, just, I mean just that little click Think about that. Every moment we're going to find ourselves in today is, is filled with redemptive potential. And then I think we have to do this. This is maybe the biggest part. I think we have to learn how to engage better in our culture. And, and I, in fact, I was thinking, um, let me just, little little quiz in the room. How many of you would say you're Starbucks people? Four of us. How many of you would say you're Dunkin' Donuts people? Y'all don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I want to show you, this is how I think so often we go into our coffee shop. This is exactly how we do it. Hey, uh, I'm going to have a tall coffee. 
Yeah, that's fine. No, I'll, I'll put cream in it. Yeah. Two, two bucks? Or, oh wait, Starbucks, six bucks? Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Right? There's too much this. And there's not enough of this. And, and what if we went in and we said, hey, how you doing? Yeah, I'm going to get a tall coffee. Hey, I see you in here a lot. I don't know that we've met. My name's Dale. What's your, what's your name? Yeah, it's great. It's nice meeting you. You're doing a good job. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. I'll be back probably later this week. I'll, I'll probably see you again. Take care. I mean, what would happen... If we, we, we said, okay, every moment's filled with redemptive potential, and we started looking the people who bag our groceries in the eye, the people who, you know, we got to know a little bit, the people who cut our hair, the people who give us our coffee. Because I want to tell you what I believe. Every moment is filled with redemptive potential. God is there, and God is wanting people who are saying, Lord, you're in this space. You're already here. How do you want to use me? And I got to just tell you, a lot of us are here because someone did that with us. I had a guy that told me after nine o'clock, it's interesting. He said, I was just reading a story about Steve Jobs. And when Steve Jobs created the the smartphone, he said, this is going to create the ability for us to be in touch with people like never before. And he said, now it's as though it's done the exact opposite. I, I'm, I'm one now in our culture that advocates there ought to be times when we just put the stupid phone away. I go out with my wife and I watch families together. I'm like, seriously? Really? And then, of course, there comes a moment when we risk, right? And we share our faith. But I just want to ask you, is it really a risk when, I don't know, one definition of the evangelism in the class I took? Watch this. One beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. It's interesting, the word evangelist, in the middle of the word, angel. And it's not uncommon in our culture to, uh, for people who have shared good news, life-saving news with another human being, for that human being to refer to them as their angel. They were just like an angel to me. They told me what I needed to hear at the very moment I needed to hear it. Might that be said of us? God, would you help us? Would you help us better step into what it means to be your people? What it means to understand certainly the thrill of good news that we can be recipients of the grace of a God who loves us unconditionally, but, but that we, we could be the euangelies commissioned by the king to run and tell good news. Oh God, forgive me when I've been so focused in my own world I've missed the moment that was right in front of me. I commission to you in this moment, I will do better at that. In Jesus' name, amen.